thank you again for joining us both in person and virtually for the vice president's black wife the untold story of julia chin before i introduce tonight's speaker i'd like to remind those joining us in person to please silence your cell phone uh, for the duration of the program our speaker tonight, Amrita Chakrabarty Myers, is the Director of Graduate Studies at the Department of History, and Ruth N. Hall's Associate Professor of History and Gender Studies at Indiana University Bloomington. An award-winning author, researcher, writer, educator, and community-based organizer, she has been teaching at the college level for over two decades. Dr. Myers received her PhD from Rutgers University, New Brunswick in 2004. She's the author of Forging Freedom, Black Women and the Pursuit of Liberty in Annabellum Charleston. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. If you have a question, please come to the mics at either side of the room, or if you're joining us virtually, put your questions in the chat. Let's welcome our speaker tonight, Dr. Myers. Good evening, everybody. Oh, good evening. I do this with my students. They know that I'm like call and response. <laughs> so if they're like really lethargic, I'm like, okay, let's try this again. Good evening. And then they, yeah. So thank you so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate, you know, this is such a wonderful turnout. And I know that there are people out in Zoom land as well. So hi, Zoomlandia. So, um, and thank you to the Filson for welcoming me back here to give a talk tonight. I... I have not been in this new space and it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, when I was here doing research, you know, this was a dream. And so it's just beautiful to come back and see it in all of its glory. But, uh, I'm here tonight to talk to you a little bit about my new book, which came out last month called The Vice President's Black Wife, The Untold Life of Julia Chin. And I did um, a substantial amount of research for this book here at the Filson as well as in about a dozen other archives throughout the state of Kentucky and across the country. This is definitely, it's an American story, but it's also very much a Kentucky story. Um, and it takes place just down the road in Scott County, which is not far from here. So um, there will be, um, I'm going to be showing some photographs throughout my presentation this evening. Uh, the vast majority of them were actually taken by me um, when I was in Scott County at different places in the county. Um, but if they're not my photographs, I have been very careful to cite um, the owners of the collection who have very graciously allowed me to have these images appear in the book. So without further ado, let me uh, do get started. Um, I just wanted to point out that this quilt that you see here is also the quilt that uh, forms the basis for the cover of the book. And um, it, it is owned by um, the Pence family, uh, two descendants of uh, Richard and Julia, who I'll be talking about tonight. Um, and the Pence sisters live in Ohio, and they are direct descendants through Richard and Julia's older daughter, Imogene. And they have a number of things in their, you know, in their family archives that have been passed down through the generations, including two family quilts. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, you know, meet with Mary Hart Harriet and Margaret, and um, interview them. And their interviews are also in the book, along with several other descendants. Uh, and in addition to that, I digitized um, as much of their uh, collection as I could, including these quilts. This quilt is actually large enough. It's, it needed to be held up by three men, very three very tall men, <laughs> so that I could photograph it. Um, and then um, I'm just really excited that it forms the cover because I spent over a decade piecing together Julia Chin's life, um, fragments, bits and pieces in order to have a picture come into clearer focus because of the lack of source materials. And so I feel like this quilt is a beautiful representation of that on their own. The individual pieces may not look like much, but when you bring it together, it's a gorgeous quilt and it's also a gorgeous tapestry of, uh, of an enslaved woman's life. So we will go ahead and get started. I tell my students that the study of US history is at its core, the study of power relations. I happen to research power by studying sex, interracial sex in particular. And interracial sex between slaveholders and the enslaved occupies a significant space in the American imagination. The most obvious example is the public's long interest in Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. That relationship was not rare, however, 
Sex across the color line began the moment various ethnic groups came into contact with one another on this side of the Atlantic. Those interactions were varied and complex, ranging from one night of mutual pleasure to intricate business transactions, from violent assaults to more compliant relationships with many points in between. What my work seeks to do is illuminate how some black women were able to use sexual alliances with white men to acquire a modicum of power in the Old South, while simultaneously revealing the limits of that power. How much autonomy did black women in these unions really have? What were the societal limits of their privilege? Did black women have any real choice when it came to participating in these relationships? Can the word consent even exist within the confines of coercion? Is this more akin then to compliance, which is something else altogether? What kinds of constraints did black women in interracial relationships face at home? How did white people respond to mixed race couples and to their children? While no two situations are ever exactly the same, we can draw comparisons between similar partnerships to draw useful conclusions about black and white power relations in the antebellum era. With that in mind, I turn to the new book. It appears at first glance to be the most classic of American stories. It's the tale of an enslaved black woman, her two daughters, and the white man who owned them all. It seems simple. You might think, I've heard this story before. A slaveholder holder turned politician had sex with an enslaved woman and had children with her. But this quarter century saga isn't your usual antebellum story. And it had deep ripple effects that went well beyond the 18th and 19th centuries. Indeed, taking a close look at it reveals how the US is still struggling with the effects of slavery and interracial sex today. And so we begin. Family tradition says that Julia Ann Chin was born enslaved and raised on the farm of Robert and Jemima Suggett Johnson of Great Crossing, Kentucky. We don't know exactly when she was born, but former Johnson family slaves state that Julia was only 15 or 16 when her first daughter, Imogene, was born in 1812. That means that Julia was born around 1796 or 1797, making her 16 to 17 years younger than Imogene's father, the Johnson's son, Richard Mentor Johnson. There he is in all of his dashing glory in his younger years. Richard was born in Beargrass, which is now today Louisville, Kentucky, right where we're standing, in 1780. We know that Julia was enslaved because her mother, Henrietta, was also enslaved by Robert and Jemima. The senior Johnsons had moved to Kentucky from Virginia and helped to settle the new Western frontier territory. While Julia and Richard grew up on the same farm, it's unclear how much time they actually spent together growing up. Jemima Johnson supposedly raised Julia to be a house servant and trained her by hand. If so, Julia would have spent a lot of time in the main house, learning how to cook, clean, sew, weave cloth, read and write, as well as acquiring the medical skills for which she was known. She likely lived in the main house starting in 1802, at age six, which is when serious instruction began for most enslaved domestics. Given the age difference between the pair, However, and the fact that Richard supposedly studied law at Transylvania University in 1800 before being admitted to the bar in 1802 and then elected to the Kentucky State House in 1804, it's possible the two had limited or no contact while growing up. Richard then moved on to Washington, D.C. in 1806 after becoming the first native-born Kentuckian elected to Congress. Although she began work at an early age, things truly changed for Julia when she became Richard's, quote, housekeeper. 1810. That was when her childhood ended for good. Richard inherited a significant amount of property from his father, including 100 enslaved laborers. He then built himself an impressive two-story brick mansion with two rows of brick cabins for his slaves. When the house at Blue Spring Farm was finished, Richard's mother came to help him furnish the place. She told Richard that he needed a housekeeper to keep things in order for him, a woman who would oversee everything. Jemima then told Richard that she had already gone down to the quarters and selected, quote, Henrietta's girl for the job. 
Julia was about 14 years old at this point and quote, well-trained and almost pretty. Those are Jemima Johnson's words, <laughs> well-trained and almost pretty. Mrs. Johnson was enthusiastic about jo Julia's qualities as a potential housekeeper, stating that the girl was quote, neat and trim, quick in movement and will not grow up bulky and awkward. She weighs only 90 pounds and will look well around the house, end quote. Now there's no telling what ran through Julia's mind when she got ready to move into the big house to take up her new post. This is one of the only remaining buildings on Blue Spring Farm today, and it was most likely um, the kitchen, one of the kitchen outbuildings. And Julia would have spent a lot of time directing folks in and out of this building and overseeing food, food preparation um, on the plantation. This was as close as I could get to it um, the last time I visited the farm because uh, the pathways are so overgrown and the building itself is not in the best of shape, but it is still standing. It was no small task being a housekeeper, especially for a bachelor politician. With no wife on the premises, it meant managing Richard's large home, overseeing the entire household staff. And for Julia, it would also mean organizing the fabulous parties for which Richard was already known. Housekeepers were powerful persons on large plantations. Julia would carry the keys to the estate, handle deliveries of and payments for supplies and goods, choose the daily food menu, take care of any house guests, organize and oversee work assignments and handle punishments for the domestic servants and more. There were also very real risks to being a housekeeper, however. It was common for white men who engaged in sexual relationships with enslaved women throughout the Atlantic world to refer to their black mistresses as their, quote, housekeepers, or for their housekeepers to be their mistresses. Indeed, there appeared to be a very fine line between the two. One wonders if this long history of sexual relations between masters and housekeepers was on Julia's mind as she prepared to become Richard's, quote, menagère, as such women were called in French-speaking areas like Saint-Domingue, which becomes Haiti and New Orleans. It certainly didn't take long for this to happen. By 1811, when Julia was around 15 and Richard 31, the pair had begun a sexual relationship that would last 22 years and produce two daughters. Archival gaps mean that there are things we just don't know about Julia. For instance, we're not sure what she looked like since no confirmed portraits of her are known to exist. At only quote, 90 pounds neat and trim, she was apparently a tiny person and everyone agrees that she was a woman of African descent. She has, however, been referred to at various points as, quote, a Negro or, quote, an African, as well as brown, mulatto, yellow, or an octoroon who was, quote, fair enough to pass for white. The nature of Julia and Richard's relationship is also up for debate. Was she Richard's legal wife, his willing partner, or his coerced mistress? Some people considered the pair to have been a married couple, concluding that despite her legal status as a slave, since Richard treated Julia like his wife and she did all the labor of a wife, including bearing and raising his children, that she was indeed his wife. The couple's ex-slaves -ex claimed that the pair had an actual marriage ceremony, complete with Julia in a pink silk dress, guests, cake, violins that played the popular wedding ballad of the day, I Will Be True, and a minister named Reverend Hayes. It all sounds very romantic, but given the couple's age difference and her lifelong status as an enslaved laborer, it's doubtful that this was truly a consensual partnership. Additionally, there's no Reverend Hayes to be found in the Scott County census records. The Johnson family also had a long history with Great Crossing Baptist Church. This is one of the only images we have of the original Great Crossing Church building, which was basically no bigger than um, of an average family home is today. Uh, it was about 1,200 square feet. Um, this building was destroyed by a tornado in the 1920s, and so the current Great Crossing Baptist building that you can go to today is the one that was built after that. But the Great Crossing Baptist Church records are housed here in Louisville um, at the Baptist Seminary here in Louisville. 
And those records go all the way back to within eight years of the church's founding in the 1790s. And they are a rich treasure trove. The Johnson family has a long history with Great Crossing Baptist Church because Robert and Jemima Johnson, Richard's parents, helped to found this church. So why wouldn't Richard ask a minister from this church, which he and Julia attended, to marry them? It would have made the most sense actually for the couple to ask this man, Thomas Henderson, to officiate, given their connection to the man, as we shall see. This picture, of course, is courtesy of the Filson Archives, where, which is where the portrait resides. And we're going to come back to Henderson in a little bit and introduce him a, a, a little bit more fully. Now, Captain John Wilson, who was a contemporary of Richard's, claimed that Julia and Richard had, in fact, been secretly married by Henderson. But there is nothing in Henderson's papers, which are also here at the Filson, and those papers are what I was able to use to help write chapters two and three of my book. It would have been impossible without those papers. Henderson's papers, there's no suggestion that he ever married Richard and Julia. We also have no marriage license that's ever been recovered for the pair, although it could have easily been destroyed by fire, which was a fairly common problem of the era. And the, the Scott County Courthouse uh, have burned two or three times in the 19th century. With three? Yeah, that's what I thought. Thanks, Dr. Apple. Now, whatever the legalities, people clearly believe that Julia and Richard were a married couple. Judge James Y. Kelly, who knew Richard when the judge was a young man, said that, quote, old Colonel Johnson had a mulatto wife, end quote. And Richard himself referred to Julia as his wife. In a letter to a friend, Richard referred to, quote, my bride, and he supposedly released a statement to the press during the election of 1836, which stated that, quote, unlike Jefferson, Clay, Poindexter, and others, I married my wife under the eyes of God, and apparently he has found no objections, end quote. Now, since all three of the men referenced had black partners or mistresses at some point, we can safely assume that Julia, that Richard was referring to Julia Chin. Even if the state didn't recognize his union, having outlawed interracial marriage, Richard, it seems, believed that the laws of God trumped the laws of Kentucky. Now, clearly, there are things about Julia that are up for debate. What then can we say about her? We know she was a woman of color, that she was literate, that she and Richard lived together for over two decades, and that they had two daughters together named Imogene and Adeline. Richard never denied the girls were his. He had them educated and he called Julia his wife. And since his career kept him in Washington for six months each year, it was Julia who would handle the day-to-day -day business of running Blue Spring Farm. This included dealing with local businessmen and overseeing the estate's enslaved labor force. A God-fearing woman, Julia also attended Great Crossing Baptist Church, which we just saw up on the screen, where she was baptized in 1828 and she had regular contact with the headmaster and students of a federally funded boarding school for indigenous boys located at Blue Spring. Known as Choctaw Academy, this is the only remaining Choctaw Academy school building also on the Blue Spring farm property today. Known as Choctaw Academy, the school opened in 1825 and it remained in operation until 1848. This is believed to have been one of the dormitory buildings. At its largest, Choctaw Academy had over 200 students in residence. Julia helped to run the school and it was her labor that helped to make it a success. It's Richard's letters to Reverend Thomas Henderson, who was headmaster of Choctaw Academy, that gives us additional insight into Julia's life. She, Imogene and Adeline all lived at Blue Spring Farm. It isn't clear, however, if Julia Julia and Richard always slept in the same house. There were several buildings on the original property, including a brick dwelling that Richard referred to as, quote, my great house. It's very possible the couple lived together when Richard was in Kentucky, but Julia also had her own place at Blue Spring, a, quote, stone house. In this way, her life mirrored that of Anna Kingsley. Kingsley was the enslaved wife of Florida slave trader Zephaniah Kingsley, and she herself resided in a pretty two-story brick and wood frame home with her children, just steps from the farm's main house where her husband Zephaniah lived. Like Anna, Julia's position in her enslaver's life appeared to have earned her the privilege of her own home, a structure large enough to house a three-room library, 
Julia may have negotiated this house as part of her and Richard's relational arrangement. As an enslaved person, however, Julia wasn't legally permitted to own anything. This was never really her house. And unlike Anna Kingsley, Julia was never freed. Slave owners like Johnson made it clear that their plantations and everything on them was their property. Richard told Thomas Henderson that if more space was required for the Choctaw students, he would just take over Julia's house for that purpose. Quote, at any time, I could appropriate that whole house if necessary, end quote. One wonders how Julia felt knowing she could be evicted from her home by the father of her children whenever he wished. An enslaved woman, Julia walked a fine line between having power and being property. Still, she exercised considerable authority as manager of Blue Spring Farm. Like slave trader Zephaniah Kingsley, Richard's job meant that he was away for months at a time. He actually would have lived in Washington, D.C. for six months out of every year as an, as an officially elected representative. So both men relied on and trusted their Black wives to make sure that things ran smoothly in their absence. Kingsley noted that Anna was trustworthy and capable and that she could run the plantation as well as Zephaniah could in his absence. Richard, in turn, told Thomas Henderson, who functioned in some ways as overseer of Blue Spring, that Julia would make sure everyone did their job. Thomas would only have to help her if she became ill, just to make sure that the laborers didn't, quote, get out of hand. Holding the keys to the plantation firmly in her grasp, like other plantation mistresses, white and black, Julia Chin oversaw a variety of matters at Blue Spring. Probably her most important task, however, other than raising her daughters, was directing the farm's enslaved laborers. It was her job to make everyone, quote, do their duty, to behave and be industrious. In fact, she told Thomas Henderson which of Blue Spring's slaves, quote, acts well, and who among them acts ill. Julia took her concerns to Thomas because he was supposed to, quote, support her authority and punish the laborers who misbehaved. In December 1825, Julia wrote to Richard, Choctaw Academy had just opened, so she was much busier than usual. To add to her troubles, she couldn't get two enslaved laborers named Daniel and Jerry to help her take care of a sick Native student. On top of that, all the male field hands had snuck off and left the plantation, except for two men named Sandy and Jacob Chase. This aggravated Julia, partly because these kinds of disciplinary issues arose every winter when Richard was in Washington. Frustrated, she wrote to her husband. And Richard was furious. Over the next three months, he wrote a stream of letters to Thomas Henderson about this situation. He asked him to speak with Julia, figure out who had been causing her trouble, and then whip the offenders. If he didn't want to flog the men himself, Thomas was told to call a constable who would come and beat the men in question. As a last resort, the troublemakers were to be sold to Edward C. Johnson's cotton farm downriver. It's clear from even this one incident that Blue Springs laborers did not always respect Julia Chin's leadership. While many slave mistresses had issues when husbands and fathers were away, Julia's situation was exacerbated by race. In what appears to be a case of while the cat's away, the mice will play, the field hands at Blue Spring pushed the limits of Julia's authority to see just how far they could go when Richard was in Washington. Julia, like many other Southern mistresses, thus had to call on white men, including Thomas Henderson, local constables, and her neighbors to help carry out the disciplinary actions required to enforce her authority, since she was unable and perhaps unwilling to punish the offenders herself. Now, although Julia needed Thomas's help in some ways, he was not in charge of her. Julia wrote to Richard. She was literate, remember. Julia wrote to Richard and kept him informed about what was happening on the farm in his absence. In one of those letters, Julia had complained about Daniel and Jerry. She also let her husband know if Thomas Henderson was doing a good job. In January and February of 1826, Julia wrote that the headmaster had been quite useful of late. He had given Daniel, the problem slave, a stern lecture, and was regularly visiting the couple's home to hear Adeline and Imogene's lessons. That's their two daughters. And he had been of great help in making the field hands behave. Richard then wrote to thank Thomas. While probably grateful that the man was keeping up his end of their deal 
which was to tutor the couple's daughters and help Julia maintain discipline at Blue Spring in return for his job as headmaster and room and board on the farm. Richard likely also wanted Thomas to know that if he didn't do his job, Julia would let him know. In addition to overseeing the farm's laborers, one of Julia's other significant responsibilities was organizing and hosting the many soirees that were held at Blue Spring. Richard was known for his hospitality. Indeed, when he was home from Washington, he loved to entertain and entertain lavishly. It's probably why he was in debt for much of his life. He, lo he loved to loan money and have big parties and like play big man on campus, essentially. But he was always in court trying to get people to pay him back. Right. So, yeah, the facade, the facade of wealth and extravagant, right, sort of lifestyle. Local folks in the area said that they were treated so well when they went to Blue Spring that they just, quote, love to go. As Richard's wife, Julia got used to planning and hosting events, large and small, often at the spur of the moment. When he came home from Congress in 1824, for example, Richard and some of his neighbors got together and invited the entire township to join them at Blue Spring on July the 3rd to celebrate the nation's birthday. No ball, however, was as grand as when the Johnsons hosted the Marquis de Lafayette in May 1825. Now, Julia was likely excited to meet the Marquis, known as he was for his abolitionist views. It's doubtful that the French hero, on a tour to visit the friends he had made during the American Revolution, would have wished who would have visited tiny Georgetown had it not been for Richard, then at, quote, the noontide of his prosperity, end quote. Richard was very popular in the 1820s. He was a hero of the War of 1812, the supposed slayer of the native chief Tecumseh. He did not kill Tecumseh, but he liked to say he did, and that's how he ran his vice presidential campaign. The slogan was, Rumsey Dumsey, Rumsey Dumsey, Richard Johnson killed Tecumseh. Yeah, it's terrible. One of the worst campaign slogans ever, right? I think we can agree. But he, so he milked that for all it was worth, right? Um, but there, yeah, it, he, uh, we don't think he killed Tecumseh, but he was a sitting U.S. Senator. He also belonged to one of the first families of Kentucky. Remember, his parents had helped found the state and established one of the most important Baptist churches in the area. His father, Robert Johnson, had signed the Kentucky State Constitution. And all the Johnson men, thanks to Robert's position as territorial surveyor, owned tens of thousands of acres of the best land in Kentucky. And among them, they counted congressmen, federal judges, attorney generals, and one day, a vice president of the United States. It's not, exa it's not an exaggeration to say that Richard Mentor Johnson belonged to his century's version of the one percenters. The gala that took place at Blue Spring Farm for the marquee was a sight to behold. Well-dressed laborers poured out vast quantities of wine and punch, and the sound of music carried into the air as hundreds of people of all classes streamed towards Julia and Richard's home. Every girl in town was there, dressed for the occasion, and each household in the neighborhood had helped to prepare various parts of the feast, since the festivities were on a scale well beyond, beyond the capabilities of just one family. Trenches had been dug by enslaved laborers along an actual branch of the Blue Spring for cooking roasts, and ladies from the area reportedly made a cheese that weighed 500 pounds for the occasion. 500 pounds. Entertainment included a speech from young Richard M. Johnson Jr., the 12-year-old nephew of Richard Mentor Johnson, piano performances by, quote, certain female guests, and exhibitions by students from Choctaw Academy. When Lafayette left Blue Spring that day, quote, he entered his carriage amidst the hearty greetings of a large assemblage of citizens who had gathered to take their last leave of him, end quote. Now, most of the work for this feast was done, obviously, by the enslaved house staff at Blue Spring Farm. And it was Julia Chin who oversaw the entire event and made sure that everything was prepared perfectly, given her role as, quote, the chief manager of the domestic concerns of the house, end quote. And it's almost certain that Julia and her daughters met the Marquis during his visit to their home. Not only did Richard recognize Julia, quote, as his wife, the mistress of his parlor, and the mother of his household, which was confirmed by everyone who knew him, he unblushingly treated the girls as his daughters, placing them at the same table with the most honorable of his white guests, end quote. <laughs> 
Visitors who went to Blue Spring that day verified that Imogene and Adeline Johnson did attend the party. They had played the piano for Lafayette that evening. The girls were 13 and 11 years old when the marquee came to visit, wearing gowns as fine as money could buy. Julia would have purchased these dresses or had them specially sewn and made for the occasion. Local paper maker Ebenezer Stedman remarked, to anyone who didn't know them, Imogene and Adeline would have been mistaken for white since they were as light-skinned as any of the other ladies at the party that evening. And there were folks from all walks of life at Blue Spring the day the Marquis de Lafayette came to visit. Rich and poor, male and female, native, black and white, the residents of Georgetown all ate, drank and danced well into the night. As if dealing with an unhappy labor force, keeping her husband apprised on a variety of plantation matters, raised the couple's two daughters, running a 2,000-acre farm, and entertaining hundreds of guests at a moment's notice wasn't enough, Julia also helped Thomas Henderson manage Choctaw Academy during Richard's long absences. Having the school at Blue Spring allowed Julia and Richard to quietly educate their daughters under Henderson's private tutelage. It also, however, increased Julia's workload. While Thomas was headmaster, he was in charge of teaching and disciplining the students. Julia oversaw the practical tasks that kept the institution functioning. This was a boarding school. Julia and her helpers, meaning the enslaved laborers she oversaw, had to ensure that every student was clothed, fed, housed, that their clothing and bed linens were cleaned, their rooms maintained, and that they remained healthy. This was hardly a small job. There was a reason that Julia had developed a reputation for being, quote, the chief manager of the domestic concerns of the house. Raising two children and running a household for a politician who loved to entertain on a grand scale was no small task. Julia, however, did all this and more, stepping into her new roles at Choctaw Academy with grace. Having been trained as a house servant, she learned, she had learned to sew and cook under the apprenticeship of talented Black seamstresses and cooks on Robert and Jemima Johnson's farm. These tools and more were put to use for the new school. For example, it was Julia who organized and directed a team of skilled Black seamstresses at Blue Spring to make the students' clothing. She also looked after their medical issues being, quote, as good as one half the physicians where the complaint is not dangerous, end quote. Her work in this area was significant. She was so effective, Richard didn't hire a doctor to care for the school students until after Julia had died. It's likely that Julia Chin acquired her medical prowess like the rest of her domestic skills from the black women on the plantation where she had grown up. Enslaved women passed herbal remedies, knowledge about midwifery, and other medicinal information down from mother to daughter. We can thus assume that Julia learned most of what she knew from other Black women, including her own mother, Henrietta. Now, Julia was also in charge of setting up all of the students' beds before they arrived. This included buying coarse linen from William Johnson's store in town to make the bed ticks or the mattresses, and negotiating with a local craftsman named Campbell to construct the actual bedsteads or frames. While it's unclear how much of the physical labor of mattress making Julia did herself and how much she delegated to the enslaved women of Blue Spring, she apparently saved the household money by, quote, furnishing some things at home with her own labor, end quote. Richard indicated, however, that even if Julia had to, quote, purchase everything, he would not object. Indeed, he stated that, quote, as to everything else, Julia has the means and can accomplish it. Perhaps she may want some aid in having a contract made for the bedsteads for the upper part of the library, end quote. Julia clearly provided a wide variety of labor to make Choctaw Academy run smoothly. What's critical to note is that she had the skill of numeracy, math, and access to Richard's money while he was away, indicating that he trusted her. Stating that if Julia had to purchase everything, I do not object, or that as to everything else, Julia has the means and can accomplish it, Richard's letters suggest that Julia could place orders and enter into contracts with vendors for goods needed at Blue Spring, since rural stores in the U.S. functioned on credit in the antebellum era. This is significant. It meant Julia could draw on Richard's lines of credit, which meant area merchants recognized her right to do so. 
It meant that in the bluegrass, Julia legally functioned as Richard's wife for the purposes of transacting business. Julia also controlled actual physical currency. She would pay the seasonal white laborers at Blue Spring each year using cash that Richard had left to her. And in a letter to Thomas Henderson in February 1826, Richard noted that, quote, after the 4th of March, I can send the boys, the students, some spending money. Or if they do not choose to wait, Julia will hand you $10 silver for distribution for spending money if they want it. That would be about $300 today in terms of the rate of inflation. Not only was Julia able to tap Richard's lines of credit in order to purchase materials for both the school and their household then, she also had access to and distributed cash to the farm's white employees and the academy's headmaster. It's very telling that Thomas, a white man who had known Richard for years and who was the school's headmaster and a minister, he was one of the rotating ministers at Great Crossing Baptist Church. He was not sent this money directly. Instead, he had to ask Julia, an enslaved woman of African descent, but a woman who was clearly the mistress of the plantation for these funds. Richard Johnson appears to have trusted Julia Chin, and he also knew that she was a savvy businesswoman. That did not mean that her life was restful. Being the wife of a politician from one of Kentucky's first families did not translate into a life of luxury. The success of Blue Spring Farm and Choctaw Academy were the direct result of Julia's constant work and supervision. She labored long days at the head of a slave force that worked even harder. Her sudden death at age 37 while caring for the school students during a cholera epidemic in 1833 was thus not only shocking, it affected the life of everyone at Blue Spring. Richard certainly came to miss her organizational capabilities. Within months of her passing, letters flooded Choctaw Nation from students at the school, complaining about everything from poor food and clothes to suspect education and dirty living conditions. Overwhelmed, Richard tried to address the concerns and persuade the Choctaw chiefs not to take their sons back home. He stated, quote, I can pledge myself that there is not a day in the year that coffee is not furnished for every boy in the school and that of the best quality, except during the cholera when there was some derangement in the cooking owing to the death of the formidable cook and the sickness of others, end quote. Julia, of course, who normally ensured that everything ran smoothly at the school, had been busy nursing everyone during the epidemic. She then fell ill and passed away from cholera herself shortly after Jerry, who was this cook for Choctaw Academy. Two days later, Richard wrote to Thomas Henderson and asked him to make sure that the boys kept their room and clothes clean and tidy. Quote, therefore, you must keep your eyes upon their clothes, and if necessary, you can get Adeline or Parthine, another enslaved woman on the plantation, to furnish, furnish any deficient so as to keep them to look well, and this without exciting other boys and without letting any person know the object, for I have said nothing of these complaints, even to Adeline, his daughter. Perhaps the chiefs may be referring to letters soon after the cholera when matters were deranged, end quote. Clearly matters were deranged because Julia Chin, he uses that word deranged or derangement several times. Clearly matters were deranged because Julia, who had always overseen things at Blue Spring, including the sewing and distribution of clothing to the students at Choctaw Academy, had died. It's obvious given how things changed after her death, how much Julia had contributed to the smooth running of Blue Spring Farm and Choctaw Academy. Equally clear from the details of her daily routine at Blue Spring Farm is that Chin had a busy life and that local whites appeared to accept the Chin-Johnson relationship to an extent. Literate, well-dressed, exercising oversight over the farm's enslaved laborers, dealing with local vendors, and interacting with the teachers and students of Choctaw Academy, Julia's life looked in many respects like that of other Scott County plantation mistresses. Some of the people she dealt with, like Thomas Henderson, became close colleagues. Other white locals either ignored her marriage to Richard or accepted it to a point, attending the parties she organized, worshiping alongside her at Great Crossing Baptist Church, and doing business with her when Richard was away. You might be thinking to yourself, a fascinating life. True, but Julia Chin's story is important, not just interesting. A quintessentially American family saga, the story of Julia and her daughters sheds light on how the United States continues to struggle with the effects of slavery in our current moment. 
While conducting research for my book, I was saddened by how Julia, like most enslaved women, had quite literally been erased from US history. Few people today know her name. The truth is that both Rich Julia and Richard are victims of an ongoing national refusal to fully acknowledge our history of slavery and interracial sex. This has played out in, in various ways over the, over the decades, including a longstanding violent commitment to segregation, the construction of the one-drop rule of blackness, the nation's unwillingness to legally accept the existence of biracial or multiracial persons, and the corresponding inability until recently for people to self-identify as biracial or multiracial on government forms and records. All of this is indicative of the US's larger commitment to structural racism, to anti-blackness, and ultimately to white supremacy. The depth of such historical erasure, legal and social, state and familial, was driven home to me when I met some of Julia and Richard's descendants. The thought of meeting any of Julia's family members hadn't occurred to me. And when I did, their stories surprised me because most of them did not know until much later in life that they were descended from a vice president and his enslaved black wife. This was not an accident. Julia Chin hadn't just been removed from the history books of the nation. She had been erased from the memories of her own kin, absent in the same way that she is missing from the Johnson Family Cemetery at Great Crossing. There, it is now a historic landmark. Richard is not buried there. He's buried with a very flashy memorial in Frankfurt. Um, because of befitting his status as an elected official. But all of Richard's family are buried in this original cemetery behind Great Crossing Baptist Church. His parents, brothers, aunts, uncles, but Julia is not buried there. At some point in the early 20th century, most of Julia and Richard's descendants through her older daughter, Imogene, crossed the color line and they stopped telling their children about their family's lineage. When I asked one white descendant why he thought it had been hidden from him his whole life, he remarked, quote, it's a closeted secret. It's not something people were necessarily proud of. I know it's certainly been hush-hush in our family, and whenever it comes up in other families, it is just as hush-hush. The white Pences, no, not any relation to Mike Pence, in case you're thinking that. <laughs> the white Pences, descendants of Julia Ann Chin and Richard Mentor Johnson through their older daughter, Imogene, are in many ways your typical American family. As one interviewee concluded to me, if you've been here long enough and you go back far enough, people are quote, all mixed up together. Native, African, European. This is the Southern story, the American story, sex, race, slavery. It's also a story many people want to deny still today. It's why Julia and her daughters, I believe were written out of the history books and hidden from the memories of their own descendants because it's uncomfortable, because Richard owned Julia. It's why we don't know to this day where Julia Chin is buried. I suspect she is on Blue Spring Farm somewhere because it was the policy of the day to bury family members generally on one's plantation. This is a scenic shot of Blue Spring Farm <laughs> that I took when I was out there. 2,000 acres, the, the main house is gone, the graveyards have disappeared. So we don't know where Julia or her younger daughter Adeline are buried. Imogene is buried just across the way at her family farm that she lived on with her husband, Daniel Pence, and they are buried there in the family graveyard on the property side by side. The sad thing is, is that we have quite literally lost the vice president's wife because blackness was and still is a stigma to so many people in this country. Because our history of slavery and settler colonial, colonialism has yet to be fully acknowledged. It's why some people are trying to eliminate the teaching of chattel slavery and indigenous genocide from our schools. They claim that educating children in critical race theory or CRT is divisive. Let me be clear, these people do not know what CRT actually is. And this is not about CRT. It's about controlling the educational and thus the national narr narrative. It's about the retention of power by manipulating children who are the next generation of white voters. It is about the maintenance of white supremacy. If we want to begin the process of national healing, the stories of women like Julia Ann Chin and her descendants are what we must embrace. We must face our history, all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly. People 
color will be the majority of the United States by 2043, one generation from today. It's time we step into that future by accepting our country's interracial past and everything that comes with it. By bringing Julia and her daughters front and center into the American narrative, this is what we begin to do. By acknowledging who all of our ancestors were and who we are as a nation today, we begin to see and construct a more realistic vision of who we can and hopefully will be. People often speak of reconciliation, of peace, of moving forward. So I say to you tonight as I close, there can be no real reconciliation by erasing our past. And there is no genuine peace without truth. That means a full and honest accounting of our collective mixed up together, often ugly and painful histories. Justice demands that. Our ancestors demand it. The only way out to the other side then is through. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Please, if if you all have questions, come to this mic or that one. Those of you on the, on the Zoom, put them in the chat, and I'll make sure that we get them. Yes. Uh, what happened to Imogene? Was she freed? So both both Imogene and Adeline Richard made pathways to manumission and freedom for both of their daughters. Uh, when they came of age, they. Both, um, he arranged marriages for them to local white men from very good families in the area, so who obviously knew who they were marrying. There was no secret about it. And he also um, passed over thousands of acres of land, enslaved laborers, and cash to his daughters and to his grandchildren. He divested himself of most of his property before he died by through notarized deeds, transferring this property over to both of his daughters and their husbands. So the farm that Imogene and Daniel that I mentioned that they lived on and then died on and are buried on, that was land that they received from Richard when they got married. That was his wedding gift to them. Blue Spring Farm was transferred to Adeline, the younger daughter. So Imogene received her own separate piece of property just across the way, mm. essentially. It was just up the creek um, from, from Blue Spring. And then the home property was given to Adeline and her husband. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chapter seven of the book actually talks in great detail about the daughters, the grandchildren, and the descendants today. Um, and the interviews actually are in the introduction and in the conclusion. So I've tried to incorporate because to me, this book is as much about the present as it is the past. So I've tried to incorporate as much of the descendant material as I can. Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, <laughs> but something that uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about, would it have been customary for the uh, wife of the vice president to spend time in Washington? I mean, we don't hear anything about that part of, of her husband's life or her life. I mean, if, is that... So it was information about that. Is yeah. there information about that? Yeah, no, I mean, this their relationship was not a secret. Right? That's what makes it so unique in some ways. Unlike Jefferson, Henry Clay, and others who were having similar relationships, they hid these women um, right in the quarters or in other places. And even if people gossiped about it, they never acknowledged them. Richard openly acknowledged Julia and his daughters but he never took them to Washington, D.C. They held down all of the various business interests and properties and managed everything when he was away. Uh, but when he was in Washington, even though everyone knew about his family, um, he was publicly referred to as a bachelor, and he lived in a boarding house with other elected officials, including some from Kentucky. Uh, so there's no record of Julia and her daughters ever actually visiting him in Washington, there are, the letters refer to the fact that his daughters and Julia are writing to him while he's in D.C. because they're overseeing everything here while he's away. Yeah. Thank you for that question. I really had the same question, but what was the origin of Chin, her last name? So it's actually, um, you know how we hear a lot about people's names being anglicized when they come here, you know, Ellis Island. Island, right? Their names were Ellis Islanded, uh, you know, that sort of a thing. So what happens is that there are lots of chins actually in Kentucky, white chins. The name actually was originally Dushin, so D-E and then capital C-H-Y-N-N-E, 
So it's like Rebecca de Mornay, for example, right? It's it's an old right English name with bourbon ties, right? With the the, the French and English, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. So de Chin was then anglicized down to Chin, and I'm very, I'm almost, I'm very, I'm really, I'm positive that both Julia and her brother Daniel carry the last name Chin. Um, and I'm fairly certain it's because their whoever their biological father was was most likely a white chin from one of these uh, chin families in the area. Henry Clay's law partner was actually a chin. So and Clay lived right up the road as well. I mean, so it's, it's there's it's there's not a whole lot of folks at this one. We're talking from the 1790s to the 1830s. Um, so that's that's where the chin comes from. But that was actually Dishin, yeah, before it was changed. Yeah, thank you. Um, did Julia ever use the name Johnson or was she referred to by the name Johnson? So Julia always was referred to by the last name Chin, but her daughters were all were were Imogene Johnson and Adeline Johnson. So their daughters carried the Johnson name um, right up until they got married. Um, so Adeline became Adeline Johnson Scott. Imogene became Imogene Johnson Pence. The girls were widely known by their father's last name, but Julia was always known by, and her brother Daniel were always known by the last name of Chin. Daniel also lived at Bruce Blue Spring. When Julia was transferred over to Blue Spring, um, her brother was transferred along with her. So, um, but we don't think her mother was. So that's, um, but yeah, that's, yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, you've you've been so kind to show Filson collections and talk about your research experience here. Absolutely. And I, I love the metaphor of of reconstructing this story like the quilt there um, mm-hmm. from all these various uh, bits and pieces. I, I love um, asking historians the uh, the archival experience question. Did you you know, did you have a, an experience doing research for this uh, project where you, you know, you touch something, you found something, you found a missing piece? Um, you know, you you had that moment of of transportation um, into uh, into greater understanding or something like it. There are so many moments like that. Um, it's really, I love that question. I mean, as much as I find right archives, I mean, I love archives. I mean, I'm a I'm a total 19th century scholar in that sense. But archives are also, and I'm not talking necessarily about a particular archive, but when I think more like sort of broadly about the archive and ha- who constructed it, right, national, so I'm thinking nationally, right, who constructed archives, whose stories they were meant to house, whose stories they were, stories they were never meant to tell, um, it, it can become also a very frustrating and overwhelming sort of, um, right, it's sorrowful in that sense to me as well. Uh, but there were, I mean, I remember reading the Filson, uh, in the Filson collection here, I remember reading Henderson's letters. And in the beginning, it took me ages to decipher Richard Johnson's handwriting. He was a terrible penman. I mean, terrible. Um, and, but then there was this moment after reading letter after letter after letter that all of a sudden I realized that I wasn't having to stop and read every word anymore. I was just reading and he, he, you know, so he, Julia, their daughters, Thomas, they are real. They were, but they are real people and very real to me. I mean, I reading those letters really sort of gave me that, that in, there's also a moment where um, the Filson has this really amazing um, image from uh, like, it's, it's an election poster of Johnson. And um, he's portrayed much younger, right from his younger years, right, his dashing war of 1812 years, riding on his great white Kentucky steed into battle, right? He was deeply, I mean, he was gravely injured in the Battle of the Thames during the War of 1812. He took five bullets. His horse was shot out from under him. He was brought home on a stretcher near death. And it was Julia who would have nursed him back to hell. But he, he always had issues with like, his arm and other things for the his left arm and other things over the course of his life but this 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 photograph right so it's it's richard right on this horse like very magnificent going into battle um and looking at it i sort of thought to myself if they only really knew 
<laughs> like, so yeah, there are these moments where I'm reading the letters, right? And I'm touching that handwriting and um, I can hear their voices. And when I'm looking at these, you know, these images um, that I just think to myself, oh, you know, <laughs> We are all human beings deeply flawed, right? Um, but you know, he put so it's that persona that he would put forward as a politician. And yet underneath it was just, you know, he's in debt, he's in and out of court, right? He, I mean, there's just all sorts of stuff boiling in the background that you would never imagine looking at him on this beautiful white horse. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you you flipped back to the uh, the image of the quilt. One of our uh, Zoom uh, viewers has asked to to go a little bit more in depth there and talk about that. So I had the privilege of interviewing a half dozen descendants for this project, and uh, they some of those folks also have private family archives and materials that you know are in their own personal private possession. So they're not at places like the Filson or Kentucky Historical Society or the University of Kentucky. Um, so I was it was really a privilege to meet them and get to know them, develop relationships with them, eventually sit down and interview them on the record, uh, you know, use the use those interviews in the book. But I also um, they opened up their family archives to me, uh, Brenda Wilfert, who lives in Arizona, and then Harriet and Margaret Pence, um, who grew up with the last name name Pence, but never knew who they were descended from until they were well, like old, married, had kids of their own, right? So they're carrying, you know, that Pence name and had no idea who they were descended from. They live um, in Ohio, just outside Cincinnati. So I sat down with um, Brenda. I sat down with Harry and Margaret, I interviewed them, but I also, they opened up their family collections to me and I digitized and took images of everything that I could. Um, and there are two quilts that have been passed down through uh, the Pence family, th through the Harriet and Margaret's line of the family. Um, and these, this is one of those two quilts, and they are enormous. This quilt needed to be held up by three different men in order to stretch it out to its full size and height so that I could photograph it. Um, so it belonged to uh, Julia's grandson, uh, Imogene's son, and um, it's it's been lovingly preserved and passed down all these generations, even though people didn't quite know that, you know, who, who his grandmother was. Right. Um, so there's and a second quilt um, that belonged to, to Daniel, to his wife. So I, I photographed both of those um, and obtained permission. I have a lot of family materials in the book. I received permission to use them, including some images um, including the image of the quilt, which belongs to the sisters and their family, uh, because I thought it was a beautiful representation of Julia Chin's life, um, as I had said before, bits and pieces and fragments um, scattered across the country, um, which on their own just don't really seem to make much sense, but you put them together and you can begin to see the outlines of a beautiful life. Um, I mean, this is a, this style of patchworking is called a crazy quilt. Um, and again, it's like these mismatched pieces and colors, which don't seem to make sense, but then you put it together and it's just, it's a stunning piece of art. And so it's, um, I thought it was a perfect reflection of Julia's life and my editor and I pushed the art department very hard to have it as the cover of the book. And I, I was very, very happy that we were successful in that. Yeah. Well, that's all very well said. Uh, thank you so much again. Can we have another round of applause? Thank you.